Well, I am honored to be with two governors of Tennessee. We have the Honorable Bill Lee, the current governor of Tennessee, and the former governor of Tennessee, Honorable Bill Haslam with us today. So we're going to start in on our conversation that will run the gamut from accountability standards to civics to workplace and workforce needs. And uh, we'll end with maybe a few fun questions as well. So I want to start uh, with uh, Governor Haslam. Governor Haslam, I had the privilege of serving with you, and I know you served two terms in Tennessee as the governor. And you noted in several of the different moments that you had to share about your goals. You noted that you wanted Tennessee, quote, to lead the nation in jobs, education, government efficiency. And you said, I don't want to just compete. I want to be the best. And everything you did was really to move Tennessee to be the best. I'd love for you to share, what would you point out that you think demonstrates that Tennessee really did lead the nation in education and get to the best um, in your time of eight years as governor? Well, I mean, I'd start with, you know, Tennessee being the fastest uh, improving state in the country in K-12 education. And while that sounds good, we also have to be realistic. Some of that's because we started at a lower starting point than we would like. And historically, we've had a challenge in Tennessee with setting our, our goals too low, you know, with not expecting enough in terms of, of what our kids can learn. And the same thing on the job front. Um, I think the beautiful thing about what Governor Lee's doing now is he's recruiting jobs of all kinds, uh, manufacturing jobs, headquarters jobs, uh, research and design jobs, and all that ties back to an education system that can produce the workforce we need. So when we talk about raising expectations on the economic front, it's directly tied to raising expectations on the education front. Yeah, you know, there's only so much time that you have. Eight years sounds like a long time. Um, in many ways. <laughs> it's a short period of time. I got a, uh, the opportunity to be with you for four years. So what work did you feel like was left undone, particularly in education, as you left the governor's role? You know, one of the, one of the I think one of the great things about Tennessee is my predecessor, Phil Bredesen, focused hard on, on education as well for eight years. It was a priority for, our, for us. It's a priority for Governor Lee as well. So we have a chance really to have a quarter century of governors who put education uh, as a primary goal uh, of the state. And one of the things that we, I think we started on, but was that whole tie between uh, uh, K through 12, your post-secondary education, whether that's technical school or four-year college, and then what you're going to do after that and tying it directly to the workforce needs. And one of the things that I've been so encouraged about that uh, Bill Lee has done is, is tied that to the workforce needs and specific training, whether whether we need more data programmers or more welders or more registered nurses um, to try to tie that link um, from from K to job as tightly as we can. And like I said, you, you, eight years does go real fast. And it's nice when somebody follows you and kind of picks that up and says, hey, here's a piece that we need to do now. And so that's, like I said, that's why I'm encouraged about where we are in Tennessee. Well, you've probably been asked this question before, but if you were back at day one, um, what would you have done differently, particularly as it relates to education policy? I'd like to hear this. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, I, the truth is I would just double down. I'd do the same thing we do, did, but more of it. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one quick story. I, I was about in year three of, of my term, and I was out in a, I won't say the name of the town, but one of our more rural towns in Tennessee. And the, 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 part, the, the town leaders were giving me a hard time that we hadn't brought enough jobs to their town. Right before that, I'd been to one of their elementary schools, and the teachers were complaining that we were expecting too much out of them. And I was able to kind of tie the two together and to say to the, you know, to the town leaders, hey, the reason we can't bring that more jobs haven't come here is because we're there's not a lot of confidence in the preparation level of the workforce. And so I think the things we did in terms of raising standards making certain we had an assessment at the end of the year that measured what we were trying to teach and holding people accountable to that and tying that closely to the, the economic future of the state, I think was the right strategy. And if, if like I said, if, if I could do anything again, I would just to do more of the same. Great. Great. Well, Governor Lee, it's fantastic to be with you as well. And as you took on the leadership of the state of Tennessee, it feels like just yesterday, it's been a couple of years, you showed your desire to keep education at the center of your work. And, and that has been seen through the last couple of years. 
you were quoted as saying uh, on the campaign trail and certainly in your time and the governor's seat that the reason we place so much focus on education is because students should be prepared for what's in front of them. They should be prepared for productive lives, not just the latest uh, standardized test. So, you know, picking up where Governor Haslam just spoke about standardized testing, tell us your thoughts on the role of standardized testing and what, what do you think it should uh, be in terms of our students' lives moving forward in Tennessee? Let, let me let me first say, and I'll, I'll answer that question in a second. Governor Haslam talked about grateful to have somebody follow that can build upon. It's particularly, uh, it's particularly a good thing when a governor comes into office and the governors before you have created a foundation. So he mentioned Governor Bredesen. And Governor Haslam built on top of what Governor Bredesen had done and really laid the groundwork for us to be able to move forward. And frankly, he had much to do with the inspiration of me even making a decision to run, uh, in part because I saw what he was doing to change kids' lives in Tennessee. So education is our fo our primary focus here in the administration. We are, I do want to be the continuation of an education governor. And uh, accountability, assessments, you know, I, I ran a business for 25 years, was in business for 35 years. We were in the construction and, and mechanical services business. So KPIs, measurement, um, metrics, incredibly important. It, you cannot improve what you don't measure. And, but we also know that if you measure the wrong thing or you measure too much, uh, then you're actually gonna have, it can be counterproductive to what you want to accomplish. So uh, it, it's important that we use standardized testing for accountability and benchmarks just to identify where there are opportunities for improvement, especially um, in this COVID environment that we've just walked through where we have significant learning loss. We have to know where kids are. We don't know how much they lost in this last period of time. And uh, as you know, we did some special session work and I, I won't talk about that right here, but we need to assess, we need to know exactly where they are. Uh, and in the COVID environment, we held harmless teachers and we didn't have that tie between assessment and accountability that is so important that Governor has them put into place and that we believe is incredibly important going forward. But I, I do think we don't wanna teach kids toward the test. We have to work really hard to not be you know teaching kids toward the test but to be preparing them for life outside but we have to we have to recognize the role of standardized testing it's incredibly important yeah you spoke about special session and it was great to watch that um, and, and how you navigated that and some of the priorities that came out one of them is you set aside about 120 million dollars for teacher compensation um, building on strong state investments in teacher pay uh, that I know I benefited from uh, for several years in the state. I'd love for you to just share, why is this a continued priority to continue to invest in teachers and particularly their salaries? You know, um, the special session, you, you mentioned it. Uh, we, we held that at the beginning of our session in early January to make sure that we could get the work done and then close that special session so that the work that we got done, whether it was a, an enhanced literacy program, phonics-based literacy program, or a third grade gate that we implemented, um, or this, this funding, the salary portion of our funding formula committed to teachers, a 4% increase there. Uh, we implemented those changes so we could put them in place and start to have an effect even this summer. Some of this were some programs that would be implemented for summer resource and summer learning. That special session was incredibly important, but we did put in um, salary increases in the, in the funding formula. You know, again, I, I hearken and often say back in my private sector days, which is not very long ago, <laughs> not very long ago but- Getting longer. <laughs> you have to, you have to, um, you have to think about why you uh, focus on employee retention and attracting high quality talent. And that's absolutely true for teachers. It's the most, arguably one of the most important jobs for the future of a state. Um, we wanna continue to invest. We wanna continue to be attractive place for educators to want to come. 
We want to add to that attractiveness and continue to invest in teacher pay. Um, and especially because we do have a system that's, that, that has accountability built into it in the pay structure. And so if we can make the right adjustments to that, then we'll, we'll, we'll be an attractive, uh, an attractive place for teachers. Well said. And uh, I think we all appreciate how you did the special session and the work that was able to take place quickly after that. So I'm going to turn our attention to civics. And I think we would all agree, I particularly am honored to be with two people who have put this as first and foremost in their minds and how they've led. So I'll start with you, Governor Haslam. During your time as governor, um, you oversaw not one, but I, I, I counted them, three standard <laughs> positions in multiple content areas. I, I happen to be part of multiple of those, including an area that many states honestly set on the back burner and didn't do anything with it uh, because of the political battles. And that was revising the social study standards and making social studies a priority in the state. Your first term saw the first revision. Your second term included another revision. And then my last year as commissioner, your last year as governor, we were focused on getting the Tennessee standards right and making sure they were clear. So these discussions and battles, quite frankly, were never easy, especially since Tennessee is one of the few states, I mean, only one of less than five that actually tests social studies knowledge in all grade levels, starting in third grade. So with that backdrop, I'd love for you to share why has Tennessee prioritized these efforts and continue to keep a focus on social studies in the state? You know, I think there's a lot of us uh, in the country, elected officials uh, and, and everyone else who are concerned about the level of, no of civic knowledge uh, in the population. And, you know, we have to realize the world we live in. We live in a world where, unfortunately, most people get their news from opinion shows on cable TV or from social media, neither of which have been edited or fact-checked. Uh, and the, 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 the level of knowledge about how government works uh, is depressingly low. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the things we've tried to do in Tennessee is make people understand, how do we get in this great country we live in, even with all of its faults, how did we get here? Uh, and what, what are the decisions that, that people made along the way that led us to where we are today? Uh, and how does all this work? You know, not just the whole, how does a bill become a law? Uh, video that we all remember, but how do, what is the end? What's the relationship between the executive branch of government and legislative? Well, how does the ju judicial branch play in? All those things are critical, and I think some of the things that concern us the most about the country come from people just not really understanding how we got here and how it's supposed to work. So, again, I think in Tennessee we've worked hard to talk about having the right standards in place. And, and then, as you said, like with everything else, measuring to see if, if, if students are actually learning that. Yeah, how do you think this focus on uh, teaching social studies from a young age all the way up through um, senior and high school, how do you think that actually builds a foundation for a more civic-minded set of Tennessee residents? Yeah, my, sometimes my fear is that we all take, you know, I, I'm in Governor Lita, so I've got uh, grandkids and you're, you kind of think about the world they're growing up in, and you think about um, do they have a sense of, of how we got here and an appreciation for that. And we live in a world that today is all about self-actualization. You know, everybody, the, the kind of the code word is live your best life, you be you, you know, et cetera. Well, we got here from a lot of people living lives of self-sacrifice. And I think it's best civics teaches us and shows us the sacrifice that a lot of people have made to get us where we are today. And uh, for me, that, that's a part that I want to make certain, not just my grandkids, but everybody else has an appreciation. I say that realizing that all the faults we have as a state and all the faults we have as a country, but realizing we're still the, the, the best there's been. And uh, we got that way because a lot of people live sacrificial lives to do that. Yeah, and, and what great models in both of you, uh, two people who had lots of success and you turned your attention to servant leadership serving the state as the governor of Tennessee. So, Governor Lee, I want to turn to you. Um, you have intentionally elevated civics education, maybe even in a deeper way in the state, by creating now a governor's civic seal that doubles the number of schools and students that now have access specifically to civic education. I'd love to hear from your perspective what you think the responsibility is of the state 
to ensure that young people understand that civic responsibility and the place they have in America and in the world. No, um, the words Governor Haslam used were, were just spot on. Um, we, <clears throat> we do live in the greatest country in the world. And, and, and those of us who have had the privilege and opportunity to find ourselves in the spots that we have, we, we know that. But I've, I've told my children, I said, one of the challenges that America faces is the longer we are in that position, you have generation upon generation that have been, uh, that have had freedom and protection and uh, the, 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 the liberties and the rights and all that is, and lived in a country that has a uniquely constructed government that is very different from most countries around the world. But if that's all you've known for generation after generation, then you begin to take it for granted. And, you know, our grandparents generally have much more appreciation for the uniqueness of America than we do and than the generations after us, which is why we have to almost double down on this idea of teaching history and civics and having our, our, the next generation understand that this really is a very, very unique country and we have a very unique way of governance, um, uh, you know, style of governance. And it is the reason that we are uh, the most exceptional place in the, in the world. And they will never learn that unless we are very intentional and very focused on it. So, I, you know, Governor Haslam ought to be really proud about this. You know, Fordham Institute, just they, they rank and recognize states um, and their history and civic standards. And we, we've been recognized as a top five state in America for our U.S. history and uh, our civic standards, which occurred before I got here. And um, that, that, that ranking is because there's been a lot of work done previous to this. We just want to build on top of that. So we've created a civic seal that actually uh, gives grants. It awards grants to schools that are going above and beyond to uh, mm -hmm. expand civics in particular in their schools to give unique and innovative programs that teach children in ways that are even beyond the standards that we have that are top five in the country. Um, schools can, uh, can, you know, they can compete for or they can apply for this civic seal and we've given out um, uh, over a half a million dollars worth of grants so far. We'll, can, we've doubled down on that grant program. So we'll be doing more of that in the, in the, um, years ahead, but our goal is to build upon, again, to build upon what Governor Haslam's done, and that is to teach our kids that we do live in the most exceptional, uh, ex most exceptional nation in the world, and we want them to know that. Mm -hmm. yeah, hey, Kenneth, let me jump in. One, one thing that Bill said that, I mean, I think this experiment in self-governing, this experiment in democracy, is it, still at, and um, you know, is the is Ronald Reagan, you know, so famously said, you know, freedoms, you know, the, the loss of freedom is only a generation away. And I think since we've since we, you know, had our signed our Constitution, I think France has had five different republics. So we're, we're the longest I think we're the longest example of what democratic democratically elected government with a small d uh, looks like. And I. Uh, you want people to know there's a fragility to that as well, that we're, we're the exception, not the rule. Yeah, I'd love for both of you to answer this question. I mean, and be as candid as you can. What's the price of foregoing civic education and, and not, you know, Governor Lee, to your words, doubling down on this uh, with the generation that we're serving in our schools? Governor Lee, you want to start that question? Uh, you know, without being too extreme about the answer there, I think the price is that um, the price we will pay if a generation does not understand uh, what a government of the people is and this republic and this democracy, if they don't understand it, then they'll lose it. And I think sometimes you see evidence of that. Um, you see evidence of a lack of understanding about 
the uniqueness of this country. And to, I, I think we lose the country. I mean, I think we do. I think what, what Governor Haslam said is true. I mean, countries that are older than us uh, have, have had a change in their government in less time than we have. Um, you can lose this. And this country is fragile. And there are, there are those who, who talk about uh, talk about that loss that could potentially happen. So I, I think simply the cost is that you lose it. Governor Hassan, what would you add? The, the same. I mean, I, one of the things that concerns me today about our, our country, it, the, we're obviously divided. I mean, that's, that's apparent to everybody. But we've also become divided and contemptuous of the other side, that we think the other side is not only wrong, but they have bad motives. And because of that, this sense of um, are we going to have a democratic process that is the model of the rest of the world, of fair and open elections, and then we respect the results of those elections uh, as part of the democratic process. But that's, that's what our founders set us up to do, and it was a bold undertaking. And again, I, I don't think people, because we've enjoyed the, the bounty and the privilege of that, I don't think there's a sense that it, it can slip away. Uh, and and I, I, Bill said he didn't want to use too dramatic a language, but I think every now and then calling that, that clarion call that says, don't take this for granted. That's right. Very meaningful conversation. I, I, I'd, I'd love to switch gears a bit because I do think having a workforce that's engaged um, and, and feeling competent and confident about what they're doing really also helps build citizens that care about um, America and the place in the world. So both of you have focused a great deal on workforce issues as governors, not the least of which was providing sort of opportunities uh, under Governor Haslam to start getting a post-secondary education under this vision of Tennessee Promise, eventually Tennessee Reconnect for all adults to go back and finish their college education under that unifying vision of Drive to 55. So Governor Haslam, I'll start with you. What are you most proud of from the work that has happened in Tennessee under this umbrella of workforce development? Well, I do think it's uh, it's that direct connection. But to one, the, the, where, where the Tennessee Promise came out of is this realization that a lot more of our jobs in the future were going to require a degree or certificate. That's where the whole Drive to 55 idea came from, is that by 2025, and this was back in 2012, so 2025 seemed a long way away, 55% of our jobs were going to require a degree or certificate. So what I love is we didn't just say, oh my, you know, we're at 32, we're, we're, we're in trouble, but we put together a plan for how are we going to make certain that that percentage of our population had a degree or certificate. And, you know, obviously COVID has put a little a hiccup in that, but we're on the path to actually make that happen in Tennessee. So, uh, what what I what I take satisfaction in is that uh, in dining rooms across Tennessee, that the conversation is, where are you going to go to school? Not, oh, I'm not going to go to school. We, we hopefully change the the conversations around those dinner tables, which I think changes the ultimate employment trajectory mm -hmm. for for those. Uh, those family members. True. Governor Lee, you are leading a, a variety of efforts on a variety of fronts to get citizens ready to work. Um, and as a businessman, I think you understand how important it is to have that readiness on day one. I'd love for you to talk more about your future workforce initiative um, that has started in Tennessee and how are you keeping this ball moving forward that may have started under Drive to 55? Um, Drive to 55 really did start different conversations around the state. Um, I served on the Higher Education Commission because I was privileged to be appointed by the governor uh, uh, to serve there. Yeah, I thought it was the big salary. I thought it was the big salary that came along with that. <laughs> yeah, that was a big salary. Uh, I learned a lot and, and really kind of, uh, it helped me a lot to go, to be on that, to be on that Higher Education Commission for a couple of years three or four years, four years before I became the governor to understand uh, the multiple pathways there are for, for kids in Tennessee. So we wanted to build upon that. We created something called the Futures Workforce Initiative and um, 
it, it's really my background is that I worked in a company. I, I have an engineering background. I worked in a company that had, let's say, STEM related, occup, uh, you know, uh, occupations throughout, but it also had the vast majority of workers that were skilled workers, plumbers and pipe fitters and welders and electricians and technicians. And so uh, my efforts and my thoughts are that we need to expand really <clears throat> the STEM opportunities in our state. So through the Future Workforce Initiative, we've created a hundred new middle school programs. Uh, we've increased, increased dual enrollment opportunities for students. Uh, we have in our post-secondary uh, work, because now through Tennessee Promise, we have so many people that have access to post-secondary. Uh, and we have colleges of applied technology all across Tennessee. And we, we, we've worked, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit in a minute about something we call the Give Act, the, the Investment Vocational Education Act, which is a high school-based program. But that program has created, along with this STEM emphasis, has created a real surge into our colleges of applied technology. We had, we had prior to this uh, past year, 11,000 person waiting lists in TCATs. So we put $100 million in our budget this year to clear the waiting list on TCATs. Um, we, we did create, I'll go ahead and, and say it, we created something called the Governor's Investment in Vocational Education Act, the GIVE Act, which started with $25 million grants for high school programs across the state that are CTE programs primarily. They're actually beyond that, they're STEM related, but basically send CTE programs. And, and we're, we've added to that another 25 million. So this combination, along with a, a real focus on apprenticeships. We've had a 25% increase in apprenticeships over the, last, over the last two years. All of that, we think, is gonna develop a workforce. Um, when, when Governor has them, when, it, when, we, when he was the governor and I was the governor-elect, he invited me to come in and sit in on and be a part of uh, conversations with a company that was thinking about coming to Tennessee. And, uh, ECD economic community development conversations, which was a great opportunity for me. And, and now I'm in that spot of talking to major companies from around the globe uh, that are considering locating their companies in our state for a variety of reasons. And, and I would say the number one conversation we have with those companies is workforce development. So that's why we've uh, gone so hard and so strong to build upon uh, what was already in place when I got here. Right. So you talked about apprenticeships and public-private partnerships. I'm curious as, as we think about that work as it relates to rural Tennessee, which we know is a priority for you. You've stepped up into that space um, and, and it was a priority for Governor Haslam. This is an area where we struggle with job creation. We struggle with making sure that we have all of our companies in those locations with the highest quality workforce. So what do you believe is going to be most effective to ensure that those communities will get the workforce they need, and particularly do apprenticeships or public-private partnerships fit into that at all? Uh, they do, so our, our state has, through the Department of Labor and Workforce, um, created an, kind of an integrated program with our K-12 and post-secondary system to create this, this pathway that leads and includes uh, dual enrollment and apprenticeships. And, and as I said, we our apprenticeships um, have significantly increased in the last year. We have about 7,000 total apprentices in Tennessee. And for context, for those that are, uh, we're, we're a state of 7 million people. Um, so it's, it's not an enormous number, but it's significantly growing. Uh, 2,000 new apprentices in 2020. And th there are, we've started 60 new apprenticeship programs since 19. What what I'm doing with uh, when I talk to companies that are coming and they're locating here and that are expanding their, their businesses is to engage them with the, the part of the Give Act that I talked about earlier. The Governor's Investment Vocational Education Act will give a million dollar grant to a high school that has a CTAE program. But the, one, of the, one of the qualifications for that program is that it's partnered with the private sector mm -hmm. so that the things that those kids, are, and it also has to be partnered with a post-secondary partner. So kids in high school, 
or have an exposure to uh, companies, and sometimes apprenticeships with them, dual enrollment in post-secondary, and then an attachment to post-secondary program that if it is a technical, uh, you know, if it's a technical class they're in, that post-secondary is likely going to be providing workforce for the local industry that is the partner. So that integrated partnership is the only way this is going to work. You know, I, I oftentimes like to say government's not the answer to the challenges we face. The people <laughs> are, and the people are uh, the private, the private companies out there, the nonprofits, the organizations that we we can create a structure, but the people, the nonprofits, the private sector, those partnerships is how we're going to get things done. Mm -hmm. You know, as a Tennessean and, and now being able to to live in a state governed by Governor Lee and then certainly work for and lived in a state governed by Governor Haslam, both of you are very pragmatic. Uh, you've thought about here's the problem, here's the pragmatic solution, and it's not something that state government can solve, but it can certainly play a role in facilitating and creating those solutions. So I'm going to end with kind of the, the questions everybody wants to ask, it's the final question. Those were content questions right in topics, but I'd love to ask both of you, if you had something to say to the other one, and maybe Governor Haslam, any advice that you would say to Governor Lee at this point in his, that you remember back in this term, two, two and a half years in, what would you say to, to uh, Governor Lee? And the Governor Lee, maybe something that you would want to share with Governor Haslam that maybe is a point of gratitude that you've been thinking about, or maybe a point of not gratitude. I don't know. Anything <laughs> you'd like to share? Yeah, thanks for the mess. I'd, I'd, I'd say two things. Number one, I mean, I'm, I, I tell people this, I got asked it yesterday by a TV reporter, like, I, I, it is. It gives me great satisfaction to have somebody like Bill follow me because he's doing it for the right reasons. And there are a lot of people that just want to go play a governor, or play a senator, and be on social media and say all the things to get attention. And there's some people like Bill who actually are doing it because they think this is a way to serve. And I would tell him what I think he already knows is it. All of us are just wired to want to uh, make an impact with our lives. And I knew when I was in office that it was a wonderful chance to have that kind of leverage to help change the trajectory of more people's lives than I thought. But now that I'm out, I realize even more true how that is. Um, it is just, I don't know of a better platform uh, to use uh, to serve. And um, again, I'm, the, the political stage is full of people who are up there because they like it being a stage. And one of the things I like about Bill is he sees it as a platform to serve. And my, my only observation would be since I'm out, I thought that was true, but it's even more true. All right, Governor Lee, thoughts? Well, um, the, uh, the truth is, is that Governor Haslam and I connect regularly. Uh, he has been very gracious to uh, to answer my call and say, hey, can I get together with you and ask you a question or two? Uh, from the very beginning, from the, from the letter he left me in my desk when I got here to the, uh, to the follow-up phone calls, uh, I, I do have a great deal of gratitude because uh, for someone who just walks into this job, uh, to be able to, there are very few people that know what it's like to sit in this position. There are only 50 in the country right now and former governors are there. They're not that many of them either. And so th there are not a lot of people that uh, that know exactly what this feels like. And so to be able to pick up the phone and call someone and say, gosh, what about this? And what do you think about that is a great help. Uh, he's been just that. And I'm very grateful for the work he did, the foundations he laid. Following a great governor is on the one hand, you know, it's a little bit of a high bar. Uh, but on the other hand, it, it is an incredible opportunity to be able to build upon something that's already happened. So we, uh, as I tell him every time we hang up the phone, I always feel better when I talk to you. <laughs> uh, and I'm grateful for that. I do have one, but I, I really do appreciate that, Bill. It's, and I meant what I said. I, I have the one other thing I'd say is this, Candace, is people should do this for the right reason. If you're doing it to be, uh, to be remembered in history, like I just, Vanderbilt did a poll about a month ago and like only like 58% of people could even name who the last governor was. Okay. And that was two and a half years ago. So I'm pretty confident by the time, uh, by the time another four or five years, that'll be about 20%. So 
it's uh it's just a good reminder like do this for the right reason if you're doing it uh to get elected to something else or to be you know to be famous it's you know it's probably not going to happen and again it's it's one of the reasons bill's doing so great in this job Thank well, you. this has been an amazingly rich conversation. The only thing I would have changed is if y'all were in my living room and we were drinking coffee, <laughs> having this conversation. Um, but it's such a great conversation with two people who truly are servant leaders in the work they've done in Tennessee and continue to do in Tennessee. So thank you for this conversation and look forward to our next opportunity to connect. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.